Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tasting Studios, this is the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. This is Bullhagen. This is Berg. And this is Vicker. Peter's here. Hey, Pete. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Monday? We would be recording, I'm doing good. recording on Monday, although this is coming out on a Sunday. Um, for those of you who thought we were actually doing this, even though we say like 20 times in intro, live from the studios, we're live recorded. I never understand why we, it sounds cool, but it's never that not done that way. <laughs> we're, we're not even live recorded. It's edited. Right. Uh, <laughs> so we've only had one live show. That's, that's true. true. I went back and listened to that once. That is a fun episode. I know, right? The good old have days. Have you listened to that? I have, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, Peter, anyways, did your, okay. uh, did your uh, um, shipment come? Uh, not yet. Not that I have seen, anyway. Okay. So, we'll we'll see. The uh, mailman Hopefully has next been driving week I have erratically, though. <laughs> Before we get into anything else, Bull Higgin? <laughs> yes. What in the world are you wearing? Uh, a sweatshirt. Yeah, I can tell it's a sweatshirt. What in the world does... Looks I can't like, tell. What is it? Like what is it? Bars. Yeah, it looks like maybe Three Musketeers. Here, let me, I'll, hold, I'll stand up to the the camera here. Costco? Costco? He's wearing a Costco sweatshirt. I mean, do they pay you? <laughs> do they pay you for tell all me, the free advertising? No, I don't that, know. Is, that is like the no, opposite but- of gangster. What do you mean? I mean, hey, I was at Dollar. I was at Dollar General with this sweatshirt on. Okay, did they right? pull their box? I was knives? at Dollar General, and I had there was a, a teenage girl and a Mexican dude complimented me in one trip to the store. Nice sweatshirt, bro. You're the best dressed person in there. Yeah. So I mean, what's the, what's not? My wife doesn't like it. Are you sure you haven't <laughs> sold out to the companies, man? This, this is, is totally. To in, this is this supposed is totally to be an on brand for show. me. It's cool and corny at the same time. You, when you're talking to the guy who's a Walmart sneakerhead, okay? <laughs> right? Oof, yeah. I love this sweatshirt. <laughs> I think it's cool. It'll t- it'll take some getting used to. Maybe it'll grow on me. <laughs> okay. Well, when when you see people start to wear it more, you'll know where it came from. Yeah. There you go. Okay, so I'm drinking some Spayburn, Speyside single malt whiskey, 10 year. So, nice. how about delicious. you guys? I've got an energy drink. I'm coming off a sinus infection and the time change, it feels like it's 11 o'clock at night at 5.30. It's dark. Yeah, I, Come on, man. I hear you. Vicar? <sighs> Vicar, what do you got? I've got a uh, Glenn Fittich, 12 year once again. Nice. You want to hear something that might be funny? So, I was feeling kind of dehydrated the other day, right? Okay. Is at the grocery store? Not that I've ever made a uh, impulse purchase, but Never. <laughs> but uh, uh, I I said, oh, I'm I thought maybe I was a little dehydrated, so I got like a, a bottle of one of these rapid rehydration Gatorades. You have you ever seen those? It's like not just Gatorade; it's rapid rehydration. It's like very fast, like the original rehydrate. formula, like Pedialyte kind of a thing. Kind of, yeah, yeah. where it actually has more of a salty taste to it, right? Mm. So, uh, yeah, this would really help because I'm, I'm feeling dehydrated. And so I buy it, I get home, I forget that I buy it, and I had it a half hour later. And I thought, that wasn't very rapid if I had just had water when I got home. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so quiet. <laughs> this has been <laughs> things I should have done with Bullhagen. <laughs> Speaking of things we should have done, uh, Vicar, what are you preaching on? I am preaching on Matthew 22 for this coming Sunday. Would you like me to read the text? Yeah, go ahead. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then. What you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, 
Why put, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. So what I'll be focusing on is that, that last bit of uh, render to Caesar, uh, what is Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's, um, because I'm going to take this as an opportunity to uh, discuss uh, what government is rightly understood and what our duties to government is uh, according to, to God and also um, uh, but the thing about, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm totally like hazy right now. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Take a deep breath. I mean, you're amongst friends. Yep. This is clerical errors. So no, because you're Glenn the vicar, you wanted it out, but that's the way it goes. All right. This is a live error. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it reminds me of my sweatshirt, right? Whose image Peter asked. That's right. It's the Costco image. You have sold out. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> look, look, I mean, look at that. Look at that. It's even got. It's, yeah, it's. It's uh, got the Costco in stitch tag on the sleeve. I almost said hand stitch, but there's no way that was hand stitched. Yeah, Han Wu sewed it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's an original. <laughs> so, uh, Berg, get, help Vicar out here. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great thing. Like, so what kind of things. Do we owe to Caesar? Uh, and we find some of these things like in Romans 13, for example, we owe Caesar honor, we owe Caesar taxes, we owe Caesar respect or honor, that kind of stuff, right? We mm-hmm. yeah, hear exactly. about that from other uh, passages of Scripture. Jesus here says in a very short way what uh, is explicated at greater length uh, elsewhere. Um, I think, you know, okay, and then what do we owe God? We owe God faith, fidelity. Um, we owe him uh, trust, fear, love, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because um, yeah. whose image were we created to bear? God's. There you go. So, you know, here you can talk about the temporal realm and you can talk about the spiritual realm. I think it's interesting to think about, okay, what does Caesar in return owe his subjects? Hmm. Well, yeah, the Bible I, act, I, I mean, you know, this is the thing is Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. Um, Caesar also owes things not only to God because he's still God's servant. And so what does Caesar owe God? Same thing we do. Fear, love, and trust. Because but, when, when, uh, when God creates order to things, when he creates order, he also creates the order of responsibility. So, for example... Uh, when Paul talks about marriage and and wives be submissive to your husbands, but he then says, husbands, love your wives. The great responsibility in that uh, created order of marriage is on the husband. It comes with responsibility and, and doing it well and care and concern and protection. All those things that uh, nobody wants from men anymore. Um, but uh, is that was that what you're kind of thinking there, Berg? Yeah, I mean, it's similar, right? Because all government flows from from the family, as our confessions say, the large catechism on the fourth commandment. Uh, I was thinking also that uh, Psalm 82 would be a good reference as well, where God says to the rulers, you are gods and you are all children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Why... Does God have such a harsh judgment against rulers who bear this godlike power of bearing the sword? Well, uh, he says it in verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. And so Caesar actually does have, he owes us things as well. He owes us justice. And, well, what does justice look like? Well, uh, let's look at the Ten Commandments. Let's look at uh, the Fifth Commandment, right? He Mm -hmm. owes me my body and my health. He uh, should defend my marriage. He should uh, also defend my property. Seventh Commandment, right? So, I mean, you can go all... He should defend my good name. Eighth Commandment, right? So... 
<clears throat> and that, that's where where a lot of the, the the laws you find in the Old Testament, the civil laws, are actually kind of important in the sense of they're not prescriptions that every government has to rule and have these punishments, but it is a guide of how God sees a government and what kinds of things it should protect. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, because, you know, you could just say, you know, take Aristotle's definition of justice, right? To give people what they're owed. Well, Caesar then owes us things as well. So I think that's always a fun concept to play with as well, because Caesar really is an intermediary. He stands between us and God. And so that means that he has enormous power. You are like gods, or you are gods. But nevertheless, he also has obligations and responsibilities, both to God and to his subjects. Yes, Which is why Christ, Christians should always want to be rulers. Because we understand what that actually means. So I wish more I wish we would stop looking at politics as a dirty word. Politics is just simply the art of living with one another in right. peace and harmony. And that's what our magistrate or our prince or whatever is supposed <clears throat> to do, our Caesar. So And and the, the politicians, as much as we, we we bag on them, they are literal representations of the people. It, it's not the other. We, we tend to think that government is the one that rules morality, but here they're voted in. <laughs> you know, all the things they do to win votes, they do those things because guess what they do? They win votes. They're giving what the people what they want. And as much as we rag on them, well, somehow they get 50 percent of the vote. You know, like the upcoming election we will have in our country. It sounds like it's going to wind up for the president being. Uh, who who feels like they're uh, that they're uh, great candidates? <laughs> How many people feel confident about that? Uh, yeah, and that's the thing is sometimes because we are able to elect our leaders, we also forget that they're not just representatives of the people's will, which mm -hmm. can be bad. I mean, every time the people do stuff in the Bible, it it's never really a good thing. Like for example, in Judges. When Abimelech, uh, you know, stirs up the people of Shechem, what do they do? They elect him king, and then they kill all of Gideon's other sons. There's right. democracy at work. <laughs> or <laughs> that that would be a great T-shirt, wouldn't it? Like, uh, uh, let the majority rule, and then like show uh, bones in the wilderness. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or um, here's an here's another one. Look at what happens when the people say to Samuel, "Give us a king." That doesn't turn out so right. good for them yeah. either. Right. Or when uh, the people pressure Pilate to to deliver Jesus over to crucifixion. So, <laughs> you know, there's a dark side to democracy. There's there is such mm -hmm. a thing as mob rule, mob rule. And sometimes the, the will of the majority is an evil will. And that's not what we owe God. That's not what we owe our rulers, and that's not what our rulers owe us either. And by the way, wouldn't you say this, Berg? This is a thought I had. Analyze this, see if I'm thinking clearly. It seems like the church's doctrine has always been a little bit straighter when we're the minority. Okay, explain that a little bit more. Okay, so like at the, like you look at the time of the Reformation, right when everyone was the same. Uh, what was the doctrine like <laughs> that before Luther? It was kind of bad. Yeah, all over mm -hmm. the place, yep. That there is a purifying nature to the tribulations placed by the majority on the minority that, in a sense, kills off all the false doctrines that aren't worth dying for. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Uh, when you had uh, communist communism fall, and uh, and the Christians came out of their hiding place, uh, I remember talking to a bishop from Lithuania who was completely dumbfounded. Finally, we're free. We're free. We can't wait to unite with all the Lutherans in Germany. And they get there and they're like, "What happened?" <laughs> yeah. Um. Because uh, the majority can kind of, if it rests on their laurels, that they yeah. kind of lose their edge. Um, 
And, you know, the the majority is very often wrong, and we need to grow comfortable with that more as a church, as Christians. Yeah, there's actually a great essay written about this. It's called. It was written by J.P. Kaler, and he said... He, and the title of this paper is Sanctification is Not Hurrah. And he talks about the difference between kind of this, you know, this is what they had us do in seminary too. It was kind of stupid. Uh, <laughs> when you'd have those banquets where they'd hand out books and stuff and they'd like try yeah. to get you pumped up and they'd be like, say, hallelujah, right? <laughs> v- Vicar knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Well, right. I know what you're talking about. When I went to seminary, it was a simpler time. I think we just learned that last last episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, but his whole point here is that a hurrah spirit is not only fleshy, right? It's something like you grunt when you're lifting weights or you're like, ugh, right? When you're lifting. Yeah. It depends on um, how many people are there. The more people, right. the louder. <laughs> of course. Or even if you're, you know, putting up a barn, you know, one, two, three, and then everybody you know, grunts and heaves, right? It's mm-hmm. it's an animalistic, fleshy thing, which already makes it suspect. The second thing is, is that the hurrah spirit really loves crowds uh, because people can get swept up in this ocean of emotion. And it really doesn't, it, it really looks down on the individual because the individual might need some more convincing. You see this in a lot of propaganda, for example, where uh, well, I mean, you can look around. The best propaganda is when all of these people are together, whether it's at the football stadium or Nazi Germany, it's really kind of the same thing. You have so many people there to to make the individual seem insignificant because you're going to follow the crowds. And times that, 12 with the internet. <laughs> exactly. And so um, the individual, which Jesus and the Holy Spirit care about because God only works through individuals, uh, that's obliterated by this sort of hurrah spirit. And the second thing is, is like, you know, it's kind of like going out and playing football. Yeah, we're going to do this, crush our enemies, blah, blah, blah. You extinguish love. Um, Things are not thought out. It's not thoughtful work or thorough work or quiet work. It's just really noisy and emotional and not very good. So I really recommend that everybody goes and reads that ep- that essay because it. I think it's a, a great way to see what some Christian churches do rather than, Mm -hmm. you know, resting on the sanctification that the Holy Spirit gives. It rests on this sort of hurrah spirit, you know, getting people caught up in this wave of temporal emotion that really just ultimately ends up hurting us. It happens in politics or anything, you know? Right. Well, there's, and especially the aspect in in some places where in a sense that's used as proof of the Holy Spirit or God working. So, and people are just susceptible to this. Are you sure you're not just salty about the let's go discussion? <laughs> Always salty about that. <laughs> I had a rapid, inter- I had a rapid hydration packet, so I'm kind of salty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yes, I, I, I have a feeling the, uh, the, the hurrah spirit gives you the opportunity to maybe rapidly dehydrate. <laughs> ah, there you go. All right, Peter, should we move on? Yeah, let's go. Let's go, let's go. (laughs) Let's go, team. You got me fired up now, Berg. Let's finish the uh, top 12. Yes. Peter, play the intro. Enough nonsense. It's time for Bullhagen's top 12. All right. Way to show that hoorah spirit. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we're going to finish up the, the last few of the top 12 for Luther's Third Invocavit Sermon on Images. Here we go. Number four. Therefore, it should have been preached that images were nothing and that no service is done to God by erecting them. Then they would have fallen of themselves. That is what I did. That is what Paul did in Athens when he went into their churches and saw all their idols. He did not strike at any of them, but stood in the marketplace and said, You men of Athens, you are all idolatrous. Acts 17, verses 16 and 22. So, um... I actually heard a really great paper on this by Thomas Fleming. He wrote a paper called The View from Mars Hill, Love and Hate in the Cities of Man. You can find it on his website, uh, the Fleming Foundation. And so I uh, I took a quote from his paper, and I want to read it, just to give a little bit more input into, you know, you men of Athens, you are all idolatrous, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, 
The opening of the speech is generally translated as, Men of Athens, I observe or regard you as rather superstitious. This seems an inauspicious opening. Of course, in the later Christian contexts, uh, D as a diamond is usually applied to non-Christians and means something like superstitious or believing in a false religion. And pagans occasionally applied the word in this sense to Jews and Christians. But in classical and Hellenistic Greece, the word is typically used in the positive sense as of someone who fears divine power and is therefore pious or religiously observant. Unless Paul was looking to be flogged, he and his hearers must have taken Bezadimon in its original positive sense. So I think that also helps the reading of Acts 17, 16, and 22. That, you know, here Paul is actually saying to them, look, you guys are religiously observant. You're pious. Um, you have even erected this uh, altar to the unknown God. Now let me tell you who that God is. Yeah, which is why it's, it's uh, mission work often goes well in third world countries where everyone has a, a belief in some sort of God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Paul doesn't come out and just say, look, you guys are all a bunch of I- idolaters. Right. But he's actually like winning them over. So do you know, do you know what I noticed from uh, from the quote from Luther's sermon is um, something that I, I make use of all, all the time is <clears throat> maybe too much. But but when you can use such a learning episode and apply it to yourself and then make that clear that you yourself had to to make a change or isn't that what what Martin Luther was doing as I did or am I did I misunderstand that yeah yeah here he is comparing himself to Paul that uh look Paul preached he didn't take a hammer and start smashing idols right but he preached and the word converted people and that's what I did as a, as your pastor. Right. And so right. that actually gets us into number three. Number three. He preached against their idols, but he, but he overthrew none by force. And yet you rush, create an uproar, break down altars, and overthrow images. Do you really believe you can abolish the altars in this way? No, you will only set them up more firmly. Yeah. And so, once again, this is a, this is a you know, kind of like the hurrah spirit we talked about before. Karl Stott was driven by the hurrah spirit. Well, let's just break them. Let's just smash them. Let's just get rid of them. Well, if you do that, if you fight the flesh with flesh, if you fight evil with evil, all you're going to do is make people cling even more firmly to their idolatry. Right, because that's a... How often do we fall into the trap of thinking that it's the law that's going to change hearts and minds? Right. I mean, the law does do its work properly when it crushes and dismays and drives people to seek their savior. But the law mm-hmm. won't actually make anybody better. Right. It, it will in the the one hand, if like if in the not so much in the kingdom of the church. I mean, the law does keep people from killing each other. Yeah, you know? it does outwardly, but it doesn't make right. them good. It doesn't make them right. better. That's true. They're just yeah. they're just hypocrites. Right. Right, but how often do we think, oh, if we just institute this rule or that law, that's going to change their hearts? Yeah, and it won't. You know, which is which is why that's so brilliant, brilliant of how uh, God defines love and the commandments as love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. It's not an outward thing that can be done just by outward things. Love yep. your neighbor as yourself. That's not can't be done just with following. Don't do this or do this. You actually have to have show love for them as you would yourself. And the only way that can happen is if you yourself are changed. As it, it seeks a change of of me being made a, a new creation by the gospel, which is the only way that that love could ever be begun. Yeah, we love because he first loved us. Right. And so, on the one hand, uh, playing uh, to to uh, red team this, okay? Um, if you think, though, that, uh, that uh, these images were actively leading people away from Christ and the gospel, 
and in your heart of hearts, you thought this was bringing people to hell, how would you act? Right. Well, and what is the theological error with that? The theological error is that idols are something. Right. And that yeah. outward earthly things uh, affect your spiritual felicity or infelicity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually uh, talked talked a little bit about this this in my uh, All Saints sermon, where I I actually begun the one of beginning the sermon talking about things like life insurance and <laughs> using accountants to make sure that what you have is passed on to the next generation, mm -hmm. and and how how much of a concern that is, uh, with then saying, but that's just stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, on All Saints Day, we remember, well, there's there's something greater than that that we leave behind, uh, that we pass on to future generations. And uh, when we think of the, mitre, the martyrs, we don't think of the stuff they gave us. You know, we think of their faithfulness. So Right. Um, yeah, and I mean, I'm glad people do do that because as Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leads, leaves an inheritance to his children's children but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous, right? It is good to want to benefit your kids. Right. But at the same time, what's the true inheritance? It's right. that which is handed down uh, by the saints, the common right. salvation that we have. And, and, yeah, and, so. and, I, and I use the, uh, the, the, the Paul, Pauline way of how much more. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. All and right. actually, I actually did something new. Uh, in that sermon, we were, Vicar and I were talking about why I said, which is also why you should consider in your will and estate planning the church. Yeah. <laughs> that make I, you feel uncomfortable, Vicar? No, no. I think it's, it's a good thing to say that because, you know, you get a lot of people who, when they die, I mean, they even, like I, I've seen this happen many times where somebody who doesn't have any family around um, dies and then their stuff just gets taken up by the bank or whatever secular agency when they could have left it to the church and uh, improved the the community of saints in this mm -hmm. locality. And by the way, uh, just to put a plug out, Lutheran Extension Fund, if you, you talk to someone from there and you want to do estate planning, they will show you that you can give to the church and wind up giving more to your family because of tax laws and how much a government gets and all sorts of things. So look yeah. into that. Right. I mean, that's the thing people forget is like, Abel, though dead, is still speaking, as Hebrews 11 says, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing with the saints. Just because you're dead doesn't mean you still can't do good works to the church. You right. can actually provide for the preaching of the gospel in a particular locality until, you know, who knows for how much, you know, maybe 100 years. A thousand years. I also addressed this in, in the sermon. Of, if I've noticed, maybe you've noticed this over the years too, that um, fewer and fewer of just uh, the members of the church go to funerals. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed yeah. that? And, and, and I, I said that uh, as long as, uh, as we have a funeral here, there no, should be no such thing as a small funeral. <laughs> the thing right, is, yeah. is like we have the funerals at the wrong times. This yeah, is where that could be... Funerals have right. to be on Saturday or Sunday or at night when people can come. Right. Because I'm not, I'm not sure it's fair to ask people to come to a funeral and, you know, take a day of work off, especially mm -hmm. if you have to take 12 days off in a year, as some years have been, right? Yeah. Hey, Vicar, remind me to, uh, to bring that up in a vote in an elders meeting. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, because the, the way I address it is, is the fact that, uh, the funeral service is important for the person who died because they want the the, the gospel to be the family to, and their loved ones to hear it. And also, wouldn't you want your family to to hear the gospel and be supported by the voices of the congregation as a witness to the family, confessing the creed, confessing the Lord's praying the Lord's prayer, uh, exhibiting the fact that to the family a whole host of people who believe, yes, this child of God is alive in Christ forever. Isn't that what you would want for your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren? And if 
taking the Jesus teaching to love your neighbor as yourself, I think it is an important thing for us to seek to go to those funerals in that setting. Indeed. Number two. Even if you overthrew the images in this place, do you think you have overthrown those in Nuremberg and the rest of the world? Not at all. St. Paul, as we read in the book of Acts, chapter 28, verse 11, sat in a ship on whose prow were painted or carved the twin brothers, that is, Castor and Pollux. He went on board and did not bother about them at all. Neither did he break them off. Why must Luke describe the twins at this point? So that's the thing. Even if they would succeed in destroying all the images in one place, there's still a whole world full of idols. How are you going to destroy them all? Paul sure didn't. Right. He even boarded a ship that had uh, Castor and Pollux on it. And, uh, and he didn't break them off, unlike some uh, English Puritans <laughs> who were so obnoxious that they did. Uh, Boom, so, Puritans. <laughs> so that's the thing. is like force will never destroy every image. And that's the whole point. All right. And that brings us to... And number one. Outward things could do no harm to faith, if only the heart does not cleave to them or put its trust in them. This is what we must preach and teach and let the word alone do the work, as I have said before. The word must first capture the hearts of men and enlighten them. We will not be the ones who will do it. Therefore, the apostles magnified their ministry, their ministerium, Romans eleven thirteen, and not its effect, its executio. So there are two points here, right? We've talked about this from Romans 14, the whole, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Bud Light boycott, right? Outward things can do no harm to faith if only the heart does not cleave to them or put its trust in them. The second thing here is that it also reminds us, too, that what actually changes hearts? It is the word. The apostles magnified their ministry, not its effect. And I think that's the thing that a lot of pastors have a lot of have a hard time with, is that they're looking for the effect, but they don't actually right. take joy in their ministry. That it's not we who do this; it is the Holy Spirit through the Word, and that we actually have to trust that the Word works as Jesus says it does, as the Holy Spirit has shown that it does. But right. that might take some time, right? And we might not see the fruits that we want to see. Right. I, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think sometimes we can get that backwards where, where we think, well, all these practices I want to start is what's going to change the heart and mind, not the heart and mind being changed and seeing the desire for those practices. Does that make any sense? So for example, um, Hannah, I don't know if we, well, I don't know if we have time to address this today, but we will at some point, asks a question about head covering. Mm. Okay. Uh, the question is, are, are you, I would ask, are you doing heavy, head covering so that it produces a change? Or are you doing a head covering that represents a change of the heart from the beginning? You see the difference? Mm -hmm. Is it the image of the head covering or is it the heart? So. It's kind of like the first three commandments, right? Mm -hmm. First commandment deals with the heart. And then the second commandment deals with the tongue. And the third commandment really deals with the body. Mm -hmm. And that's the progression. That's the way it has to go. Right. And so our rights and our actions should reflect the faith that we possess. Right. So. All right. Good discussion. Um, and a great top 12 list. Yeah. Yeah. Someday I'll write a top 12 list with so much thought that it's going to take three episodes to get through it. There we go. Because I think the last top 12 list I did, what, in two minutes? Poor Vicar. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, people like the angry Bullhagen. I don't know. I don't know. It's all that novelty. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we have... Uh, Berg is on a roll. You are have been on a uh, a creative tear for the show, Berg. I want to compliment you on that. We do what so, we can. Uh, uh, we have a confound the clerics. Peter, play the intro. Confound the clerics. So, uh, 
Berg, you had saw something on uh, Facebook posted by uh, the podcast mom. Right? Yeah, so she sent me a text message, and she said here, I know I could slash should send an email, but texting you is much more dot, 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 satisfyingly reciprocal. <laughs> <laughs> 100% <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I want to be clear. Everybody has that email. It's not just me. Because <laughs> <laughs> you sent you send me a response to a question that I didn't see. Yeah. Well, I put the question in there. So right. yeah, yeah. At, the, at the top it says, uh, so Hannah asked this question, what do people mean when they say the Holy Spirit laid something on their hearts? Is there a better way to say it, or is this even something we should expect from the Holy Spirit? And she's asking this question because of this quotation from Facebook, which said this, If the Holy Spirit has placed it on your heart not to participate in Halloween, we ask that you be sensitive to his leading. There is likely a good reason that he has placed this burden on your heart. You may not even know the reason, but there's a reason. Well, well, (laughs) well, (laughs) well, well. That is a a different way than I've usually heard it because that was not like you came to the decision or realization in any sense, right? That was just, hey, have you thought about maybe not doing Halloween? Well, then you shouldn't do it because you thought about it. Right. Right. So here, I mean, it sounds like to me, and I can talk a little bit more charitably here a little bit later, but... um it seems to me like if the Holy Spirit has placed something on your heart, it seems to me to be an emotional response to a particular thing that is non-rational. Okay? I think, is that fair to say? That yes. when the Holy Spirit, when they say that the Holy Spirit has placed something on their heart, they're saying that the Holy Spirit has created this sort of emotion that may or may not be rationally right. based. Right? right. It's sort of a Sort of a want usually right. is how i've heard it used or you yeah you have something on your heart and and because that is on your heart uh, you have created a god in your image and said oh this is what he thinks cuz i think that yeah so i yeah. mean i would i would argue that this is not very clear language and we shouldn't talk this way for a couple of reasons i mean the first reason is that the words that are written here don't seem to take into account that god only speaks to us through his word, that the Holy Spirit is working outside of his word to create these feelings, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, charitably, you could say that people studied the Bible uh, before God laid something on their hearts, but that doesn't seem to be the case, especially with the quote above. Uh, if the Holy Spirit laying something on your heart is simply a feeling that you get, uh, you should be really cautious about that because— the Bible tells us what the human heart is in Jeremiah seventeen nine. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And we also know that Christians struggle against this remnant of flesh in our bodies. Galatians five seventeen says, "For the for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish." God only wants to talk with us and have us set our hearts on his written, explicit word, not on feelings. See this in Deuteronomy 32, 46. Moses said to the people, Set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law. So my first thing is that this seems to suggest that the Holy Spirit speaks to us apart from God's word. And that leads to some pretty bad places I mean, this leads to things like Mormonism, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Not cool. Yeah. Yeah. The other side of this is that this statement doesn't seem to take into account that we are also spirit, that is, regenerate Christians with new affections, that is, feelings. The Lutheran Hymnal, uh, 369. This is uh, this is the this is the hymn uh, in in Adam all mankind fell. And stanza Mm -hmm. six says this, We thank thee, Christ, new life is ours. New light, new hope, new strength, new powers. May grace our every way attend until we reach our journey's end. So the Holy Spirit does create in us new feelings, right, that are distinct from the Holy Spirit. And 
this doesn't seem to say that. It seems like every sort of religious, you know, wibble, wibbly wobbly feelings you get, that this all comes from the Holy Spirit directly. Instead of right. saying no, the Holy Spirit actually does regenerate us, and that we are small, we are small s spirit, because we've been created by the Holy Spirit. I mean, what if you do if if God laid it on Hannah's heart to have Halloween? Right. Well, and uh, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> I mean, you hope th- they don't meet. <laughs> yeah, this get this Awkward. gets us. Yeah, this gets us to the second thing, right? <laughs> Having strong Christian feelings about something doesn't mean that God lays it on your heart. I mean, look at Second Samuel seven, where David wants to build the temple. It's a good and godly desire, right? Mm-hmm. To build a house for the Lord. And Nathan, his pastor, also endur- endorses this at first when he says, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. And then what happens? God tells him not to. Yeah, God tells him not to and gives him something better, saying that God will build a house for David. That is, the Christ would come through him, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is the same thing with pastors. First Timothy 3, one. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. The desire is good, but that doesn't mean that one can or should be a pastor if you don't fit the qualifications, right? Right. right. I mean, yeah. if you right. are unable to teach, you shouldn't be a pastor. You can have a great desire, and that's a wonderful desire, but mm-hmm. you can't do it. If you're a woman and you want to be a pastor, it's a good desire to want to serve the church. You can't do it because God forbids it, Right. Yes, because, yeah, he, he, did, he didn't lay it on your heart. Exactly. So a behind-the-collar moment here, this kind of reminded me of the confusing language about inward calls and outward calls, right? Mm-hmm. Right. I'm sure Bullhagen has heard that before quite a bit. And it's better to speak of godly desires that we right. have on account of our sanctification than to speak of the call and then speak of the call in an objective, external way, whether it be in marriage or as a pastor or to the government. Right. Like, because so I can say, ah, oh, I feel called to do this. Well, what happens if God doesn't actually give that to you? Was God frustrated in his, in his, uh, his call? No. Right. And, and, uh, and I think that's how people think we deliberate calls, by the way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, it's going to take four weeks because I'm waiting for God to. Like you got to go home and cast lots like seven <laughs> times a day, kind of a thing. <laughs> Right. Indeed. Magic eight ball. Check That's that right. later. <laughs> so now I'm sure like our well meaning Christian friends who like to use this kind of language would bring up some objections to this. Like so one person they could bring up is Jonathan. First Samuel fourteen seven. Whereas armor bearer says to him, Do all that is in your heart, go then, here I am with you according to your heart. But look at what all comes before that. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Jonathan here has a godly, patriotic feeling. He wants to save his country and to drive out God's enemies. But he doesn't say that his feeling is necessarily God's feeling. It may be that the Lord will work for us. That's why he says that. Or, for example, Saul in First Samuel chapter 10. When Samuel says to him, And let it be when these signs come to you, that you will do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. But Saul was externally anointed and called by God through Samuel. Samuel also externally preached to Saul, telling him what would happen. So unless a judge or a prophet of the Lord informs you, and you are literally an anointed one of God, <laughs> uh, then this promise is not for you. Okay? Yeah. So I have maybe if we could provide a checklist for people at home. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you know, uh, yeah. Has uh, yeah. Has the pro- Has do you do you know a prophet? Has a prophet spoken to you? Has a prophet foretold the future? Has he uh, anointed you king? Skip to box J. Yeah. If not, then no. <coughs> and then, you know, there's another one here with uh, 
the people in Ezra 1.5. This is one they bring up a lot. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirits God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Okay, so they'll use that to say, see, God laid this on their hearts. But this godly emotion was based on certain explicit verbal promises that God made through Jeremiah in at least three places. Jeremiah 30, verse 3, Jeremiah 30, verse 10, and Jeremiah 46, verse 27. So they had an explicit promise to do this. Okay? Right. So um, what are the applications here? Well, it goes back to Romans 14, 14, where Paul says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And so Hannah's question really has to do with the conscience. Nothing is unclean in itself, even Halloween. It is not demonic. It has been a Christian holiday for 1,300-odd years. And there's been com considerable debate among scholars on whether all, the, on whether all saints replaced the, the Celtic holiday Samhain. Now, there was a day for propitiating the vengeful dead in the Roman calendar, but this festival called Lumeria was held on May 13th, not on November 1st. So all I got to say about this is gut feelings are about things are worth listening to. Uh, we moderns don't often listen to our guts enough. Remember, we Christians do actually have new and godly emotions, affections, powers, and the like. If something doesn't seem right, then it might be wrong. We've almost gotten two-sided on the intellectual stuff. But gut feelings aren't always right. Ignorance, like in Romans 14, actually hurts the conscience and makes things not free, which God has made free in Jesus Christ. So in order to find out if our gut feeling is actually spiritual, that is, from the Holy Spirit and from his word, then we must actually do our homework. We must actually diligently search the scriptures. We don't just go off of gut instincts. We should listen to those instincts, that's true, but we should also see if our emotions and thoughts line up with God's word. While we are sanctified, right. we have not yet achieved perfection. That's, so so that, that, does, that doesn't mean, so what you're saying is, part of this is, it doesn't mean that God doesn't lay things on your heart, right? Right, but you can't say for certain that God has, because he hasn't told us explicitly in Scripture that he right. has done that. So, for example, right, uh, when, uh, what, what lead, we talk about uh, going, becoming a pastor, right? Mm -hmm. Right. God gave you the skill, the desire to do those things, right? It's not like he didn't give you all of that so that you would be a pastor for, right? Right, yeah. Well, I think one piece of wisdom that I was given that I think is applicable here is uh, somebody, one of, the, one of the professors once told me that, um, you know, you have that desire to come to seminary, but if you uh, sort of stamp it down and just keep going throughout the years, if, you know, 15 years later, you still have that want and that desire, um, it it probably was God calling you to the office. Uh, but you can't just on a whim say, hey, God's giving me that call, even though you're just just a late person. I don't know, maybe you need to cut some of that out, but I don't no. know if that was too far. Well, and Not I even... out now. I mean, I, <laughs> I look at it too from the perspective of marriage. So I remember... Uh, this happened a few. This happened a number of years ago, and I was uh, talking to a dad whose daughter uh, wanted to. She was convinced that God had laid it on her heart that she was supposed to marry this guy, mm. even though they had never talked and he wasn't really interested. Yeah, I, I know of a similar instance where somebody lived his life by casting lots for things, um, and so he cast lots on whether or not to marry this girl. And, uh, well, the lot went in favor in his favor of yes. And so he drove up there to try to marry her, and it did not work out very well for him um, in multiple aspects. Hmm. So, and, and that's the thing. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, a, that's what Julie did. I, you, you, she cast lots for you? No, she, oh. <laughs> she told her, before we even dated, she told her mom she was going to marry me. Oh, okay. And that's, yeah. what, that's what's my line to that, Peter? That's what made her different than every other girl. <laughs> she was right. Ha. Huh. 
<laughs> well, and that's the thing is we have to trust in these external calls, right? You're not married till you're actually married. You're right, not a right. pastor until you receive a call. Right. Right. And I through the that, through a, like a voters meeting, at least here, you know, not that. I mean, that is our that is the way we have things set up, right? Right. That right. if you know, we call through congregations and the like, and that is God calling. God does mm-hmm. not call you until that point. It's a godly desire. You want to serve the church. It's a good thing, right? It's a good thing to want good things. Mm-hmm. But just like David, that might not be for you. Right. You might want is... to build the house of the Lord, but maybe that's not your task. That's that's what we, isn't that coveting? <laughs> Desiring something God has not given you. Right, and think about when these things fail. So this guy who cast lots and went up to marry this chick and uh, she refused him. Uh, well, was God wrong? Did no. he just cast the, the lots wrong? Uh, I mean, <laughs> what, it, what it does is it, it actually defames God. Because as yeah. we talked about in an earlier episode, um, you know, marriage is one of those things that is actually left up to our freedom, just like occupations. Mm-hmm. Peter could have yeah. chosen to gone to the seminary. He chose something different. And that was in that was in the purview of his freedom, right? Don't we have a whole article on this in the Augsburg Confession? Mm-hmm. Right, Vicar, what is it? Do you remember? Uh, not off the top of my head. Was it Article Isn't Eighteen? It one of the teens? Right? Is it Article Eighteen? I think it's Article Eighteen. Uh, I think let's you might it, be right. Let's see if I'm right. I know it's in the teens. I don't remember where though. Okay. I like how you ask Vicar and not Bullhagen. I'm not the vicar. I should know this. I'm bringing back the vicar app. I know what it is. I'm just letting them figure it out, Peter. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. I see if if God <laughs> laid it on their heart correctly. Ha <laughs> uh, ha. Let's see here. Article eighteen. Yeah. Of you got free it. will. So. Hey, I'm gonna say something that's gonna drive you. Since we're talking about numbers, Kirk, <laughs> I'm gonna say something that's gonna make you laugh. Okay. So I helped out, out at auditions for Allstate at the high school. Okay. Like it. So when you talk about Allstate auditions, right, they're the brightest of the bright. Pretty much, right? Like the be- better musicians tend to be better. Maybe not in Vicar's case. He's a musician. But usually the better uh, musicians tend to be better <laughs> students as well. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd agree with that, but sure. Yeah, go ahead. And so they, they are supposed to report to audition at site numbers. And mm. they put the site numbers in Roman numerals. Nice. And everyone kept on walking by, just confused. Do you know where site seven is? Look Man. for a VII. Okay, thank well, you. Any musician should know that. <laughs> Where's Isn't 12? Like a Look for mo- an X. Movements I-I. are usually in Roman numeral. Movements, just- music theory. A bunch of things. Jazz is in Roman numerals. If you if you're a musician and you've been playing for a couple of years and you don't know what Roman numerals are, you should change that. So for the second movement, they have a number two. <laughs> <laughs> this has been <laughs> bad jokes <laughs> with Bullhagen. <laughs> it, it's it's a movement, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, thank Eight you minutes. for that question. Now, one thing we're, we're, we're toying with the, the idea of a new segment, right, mm-hmm. uh, which is called red teaming, which I, I ha- don't really hadn't heard before, and so I'm going to ask uh, Berg to explain re- red teaming for us. All right, so red teaming actually started during the Napoleonic War when the uh, Prussians lost to Napoleon. And so it was the original war games, actually, where you would have the loyal opposition play the enemy and try their best to defeat them, to find out, okay, we are deficient here and here and here, so we need to make up for that. And so red teaming... Nowadays, oh, go ahead. nowadays in the IT world, it's uh, very similar to that. You have the good guys try and hack into you so they can tell you... Oh, this is how we got you. This is what you need to fix. Right. All right. So um, the idea was to to have this on the podcast. I'm not sure if this is going to work. So uh, I was thinking maybe we could kind of red team 
so if we, I just picked a random topic, Berg, of potlucks. So how would we, like, if we wanted to red team potlucks, how would we do that? Okay. Um, <laughs> potlucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that the worst idea ever? <laughs> um, so, so one thing would be is uh, you can, well, I'm sure you can do it a couple different ways. One way you could do it is you talk about uh, what you think it is. And then I try to shoot it down. We could also go the other way, the more the the disputation way, like what Thomas Aquinas did, and start with. It seems that we shouldn't have potlucks because of X, and Y and Z, and then you give your real answer after you've been charitable in putting forward all of the objections, and then you answer the objections af- underneath. Oh, I don't like either of those. I just want to fight. So, <laughs> All right, so uh, I think well, there's four of us. We put we put two two on a team. All right, one is on the green team. We decide which one is the green team and the red team, I suppose. All right, which which one well, is obviously the... obviously I want Peter on my team, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, because because Peter knows all my vulnerabilities. Well, I'm better on the red team though. All right, can we be red team? Can Peter and I be red team? All right, you can be red team. Okay. All right, so they have to. Uh, you're going to be side potluck, pro potluck, if you will. Yep, pro potluck. Yeah, yeah. Red, red team is anti potluck, I think, because yes, we're, we're going to be. Anti-potluck. We generally agree that potlucks are good. I think. Yes. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> maybe Berg. Maybe it should be Berg and Peter. Maybe Berg should be on the red team. No, this is more fun to have Berg on the on the green right. team than if he if he disagrees. <laughs> Right, kind of reminds me of uh, Conan O'Brien. He used to do this this uh, in the early days. He'd do this uh, segment called "Right Side, Wrong Side," where he would make someone like try and stand up for something that's obviously wrong. Mm-hmm. No, I actually think that's a good exercise because it it sharpens your intellectual skills. It forces you to take seriously because I think that is one of our issues: is we don't take well-meaning people who have you know differing confessions than us or whether that be political or religious uh very seriously we just dismiss him oh he's a lib or oh he's a boomer okay boomer right and right. i think we need more of this in this world where we defend positions that we may actually find objectionable to make our own arguments stronger so right all right i don't like potlucks man why not Hey, I'm the red team, man. Okay. Yeah, you have to All tell right. them why it's bad. Right. Yeah. What do you mean? Okay. You get to say it's bad. <laughs> I don't like potlucks. Anyways, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> All right. So Dub for the lo- for the red team, let's go. <laughs> so potlucks create community. That's why we should have them. Do they create community? You know, as a pastor, I see how everyone watches what I eat. It becomes a competition. Whose dessert is better? Who's uh? Who has the better dishes? Is that people are always people are always fighting as to like where the dish is going to go on the table. People get offended that oh you put mine at the end so nobody would eat it. You know that we're causing drama here. And if there's like the one or two people that are in charge of the potluck, they become the arbiters of the potluck, and if everybody yeah, hates I'm them, this queen potluck. Look at me. Yeah. Look at me. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then they even judge you for what kind of table service you bring or what kind of basket you bring your potluck in. You bring Seriously. you bring some paper plates and some plastic silverware and you see you look over the table over and they brought their full dinner plates right. and their like metal silverware, their china. Right. Hey, hey, someone does, brings Does this so- actually happen? Oh. What do you mean? All the time. <laughs> all the time. I've I've never seen anyone bring. And then and then when the, the, the one time when too. someone brings something that everybody wants, right? <laughs> and it, so someone brings like a bucket of KFC. Everyone judges that person, right? You just went to KFC, but everyone attacks that KFC. Yeah, but what what a great opportunity to teach them how there are greater lights and lesser lights, not only in the church but also in food production. Right. That there Potlucks are, are communist. But okay, <laughs> why why are they communist? <laughs> it's socialism, man. Okay, it's so, it's, so it's we are pooling, forcing it's pooling food together. So we are forcing people to to bring food. 
I thought this absolutely. Was vo- I thought this was so, volunteerism. So I mean, it's having, volunteerism, but everybody has to bring something. So having somebody freely sign up to bring whatever they want to a potluck is communism. Are you saying that the people who don't bring anything don't get judged? Oh, they get judged. Oh, right. <laughs> or if they just bring something small, well, like, come on now, have you ever like gone to a potluck and you see a a, a, a tub of cottage cheese just sitting there? And you're just like, well, they, they put in the effort today, huh? Right. Like they went to the store and they bought cottage cheese. Right. Or you and then put everyone the commandment on it and say, they're just keto. Right. And they, they admire the person who stayed home from church to bake the lasagna. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. That's not community. <laughs> it becomes a... It actually, in a way, it, it's They're almost just, like be, the becoming potluck a just, god. Uh, the, the potlucks just replicate Acts chapter 2, where they held everything in common. And what does Peter say to An- Ananias and Sapphira? Uh, couldn't you keep what was yours? Well, so I think you're there, conflating not, table uh, fellowship. <laughs> right? <laughs> With the, Isn't that more about... Uh, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the prayer, and the breaking no, bread. It, it literally says they held everything in common, and they went and sold their fields. Barnabas is Have one of them. Have you spoken to Arthur Just about this? <laughs> <laughs> so, another thing is, like, like say, people say, I laid my heart to bring this food, right? <laughs> but then it gives you heartburn. Well, it's yeah, just, it's just what, mortification it, of the flesh. Sounds yeah, like a good I, thing to me. Yeah, I mean, it's just like what the pro- what happened uh, what to the prophet Ezekiel, where he gave him the scroll and he ate it, and it was like honey in his mouth, but in his belly, it was it was very bitter. Besides, it's just for us. I mean, if we really wanted to do something helpful, we invite uh, the homeless, the hungry, the people who really need food. Aren't they Please invited to church every to our... Sunday? Do I don't think those the... two things are mutually exclusive, though. Yeah, do you I mean, lock the doors there are plenty of churches church? that do. There are plenty of churches that do soup kitchens and potlucks. I haven't seen them. Uh, I haven't. I have. Have you gone to one? Was it your church? It wasn't mine, no. Oh, so because you've seen it done somewhere means that all potlucks are good. <laughs> I'm just giving you examples. <laughs> Not all potlucks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not all potlucks. Yeah. Besides, like, I've, I've never seen anyone the... just bring a tub of cottage cheese to a potluck. <laughs> Or what do you mean? It happens every time. Who does that? <laughs> oh, come on. Where Besides, the word, the word luck is in the name, right? It's like, good luck, bro. I know or, what you're doing this afternoon. That's pretty diminutive. To... <laughs> or it could come from Glücklich, the German, which means happy or felicitous. Yeah, Glücklich sounds like something that comes out of your mouth. <laughs> So. <laughs> yes, rapid dehydration. <laughs> All right. So if you like this, this argument, is so stupid. We need to. We, <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, so if you like this, the listener needs to give us something better to argue about. Right. Because this was really bad. This is r- amazingly clerical Aries bad. <laughs> by the way, we're not judging you if you bring cottage cheese. You, you yes. do you. But. Right. <laughs> right. Hey. And by the way, I kind of like potlucks, even though I can't eat any of it anymore. <laughs> Hey, next potluck, throw everybody for a loop and bring a drink. <laughs> bring some Dude, you punch should try something. some, uh, can't you try like keto pickles? Like keto fried pickles? They're really good. A little bit you of can't have wheat. fried pickle. Oh, no, there's no wheat in it. My wife can eat them. In, in fried pickles? Keto fried pickles. So she uses like an almond flour, a little bit of egg, and a little bit of... You can't have nuts of, uh, either. Oh, you can't... What? Oh, nuts. Oh, nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Now he's sad. Okay, yeah. let's wrap this up. Listener, uh, Vicar, if the listener wants to send us a topic for red teaming, uh, where they can, where can they get a hold of us? Yeah, they can get a hold of us via email at feedback at clericalerrors.org. They can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash podcast, and they can tweet at us. Uh, Excess, bro. Sorry, Excess. Um, at clericalerrorsp. P for podcast. Right. So, so Berg, if you w- if you would please ask me if I get to have uh, these fried pickles. What? <laughs> Guess what? I can't have these nuts. Keep- <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that God a candy? <laughs> well, isn't that also a candy bar too? <laughs> That's true. Uh, only because of the joke. Okay. Berg's been watching Mr. Beast. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm not sure I don't, who that is. I don't, I don't even know what Mr. Beast is. I just the, uh, You just talked about the Beast Bar, though. What is a Mr. Beast? 
I just saw it in the grocery store the other day, so I, I'm It's pretty... a YouTuber. It's a YouTuber who made a chocolate brand. All right, let's redline Mr. Beast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Redline, no, red team. Yeah, red we're team. Not, not red we're line. not red teaming Mr. Beast. <laughs> okay. All right. This has been the Clerical Heirs Podcast. This is Bullhagen. This is Berg. And this is Vicar. And may God's word be laid on your heart. Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical heirs podcast, on Twitter at clerical heirs P for podcast, or email us at feedback at clerical Thanks for listening to Clerical Heirs. See you next time.